What are we talking about today on Sci-Fi Weekly? Buckaroo Banzai! When are we going to talk it? Real soon. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Sci-Fi Weekly. Hello there, nerds. Welcome back to Sci-Fi Weekly. Oh, yeah. Uh, today on Sci-Fi Weekly, we are going to be talking about Buckaroo Banzai and how we would reboot it. So, hey, let's reboot Buckaroo Banzai. I'm your host, Zach Wilson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at ThatZachWilson. Join me across the table. We got Jesse Klein. Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, I'm super excited about this episode. I've been thinking about it for weeks. I love this silly disaster of a movie. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorite. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at JessKlein1. That's J-E-S-S-K-L-E-I-N, the number one. Let's dig our teeth into this. Yeah, well, first of all, we're going to... Just a quick run through the show. We're going to break down all the news from this week at ludicrous speed. Then we're going to get into a couple things we want to get into. Some news to get into a little more sure. deep. Some cool trailers came out today, inclu- this week, including Luke Cage and the first footage for Arrival. Uh, then we got some sci-fi in real life. And then Buckaroo Banzai. If you Buckaroo want to skip Banzai. ahead, take a note of the uh, links below where the time codes. We'll put those in uh, after we go up. And then uh, you can just jump ahead to the Buckaroo Banzai part if that's what you're here for. All right. Let's kick off. Ludicrous speed. Ludicrous speed! Go! The latest franchise to get a Monopoly game, unexpectedly, <laughs> Rick and Morty. Uh, this is the thing that we all never knew we wanted. Uh, uh, so pieces bad. inside include you can play as the Me Seeks box, the portal gun, or a plumbus. <laughs> uh, the blue spaces, in case you're wondering. Rick's garage and Morty's bedroom. And then, but if you're like me and you know how to win at Monopoly, sure, you're gonna go for the brown and light blue spaces that include Needful Things, Morty's High School, Earth C137, <laughs> and Gazorpa Zorp. Perfect. Uh, this is gonna get into like some really heavy like metagaming arguments, where like if you lose, you're gonna be like, yeah, I lose in this universe, but in <laughs> a parallel universe, I have won this game. <laughs> And then all of Earth's history will change. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah. Time crimes. I want to play it. Yeah. It comes out uh, in October. All right. Uh, up next, it turns out that Powers got canceled by Sony slash PlayStation. That's too bad. I really like the books, but this TV show seemed like it was kind of doomed from the beginning. Uh I, I don't know. I'm bummed about it, man. With, with with content in so many different places, I think it was hard for PlayStation to become its own outlet. Yeah. So even re- regardless of quality, it was tough for it to find its audience. Which is too bad. It's a really interesting story. If you haven't read Powers, I recommend going out and reading it. It's a really interesting look at the dynamic of what being a superhero is. Yeah. Uh, Lionsgate... Uh, has determined that they're not only going to turn the last of the Divergent series into a TV movie, but they're going to turn it into a series. So for all of you who thought, you know what, I'm kind of annoyed that they're splitting up final books of series into two movies to try to get more money out of us, be really annoyed because this is hopefully not, but is maybe the start of a trend where they're not just turning the last movie into two, but turning it into an entire series to stretch it out as far as they can. Uh, series star Shailene Woodley said uh, that she is apparently very unhappy because why? <laughs> because why indeed. Uh, other bummer news, it looks like Ghostbusters sequel is getting stalled. Uh, even though when it first came out, there was like a gar- like uh, someone at Sony was like, guarantee there's gonna be a Ghostbusters sequel. Uh, they didn't make as much money as they thought they were gonna make. Uh, a lot of that is hampered because China can't show the movie because it has ghosts. They're reportedly seventy million dollars in the hole. Yeah. On Ghostbusters, uh, although some of that's mitigated by stuff like merchandise, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sure once DVD sales and everything come in, but it'll make its money back, but not the success Sony was hoping for. Yeah. Uh, they are reportedly working on an animated feature. Yeah. That's coming in 2019. Which, great. Fine. Sure. I but no word on if it's going to be the this new, new gang or something completely different. Yeah, original team. 
Uh, Brie Larson <sighs> is doing her Captain Marvel research in a Captain Marvel sweater, and squeeze were heard across the multiverse. Yeah, I've, I've never fallen in love so quickly. <laughs> I mean, if I wasn't already in love with Brie Larson, this picture is just... It's it's perfect. I, like look, we all want our our actors to care about mm -hmm. the projects that they're on as much as we do, and obviously like now she's whether or not she had read this before. Yeah, she's she knows what her audience is. And yeah, that like this is lot. this is for sure like a planned photo that they're like yeah, people will go crazy seeing this. But the fact that she knows that people will go crazy seeing this shows something. Yeah, uh, Spider Man shows off some new web shooters. Uh, in a new picture, uh, so we're not getting the biological webs coming no, out of the no wrist. No biological webs. <laughs> uh, it, to me, it looks like probably Stark tech. Uh, yeah, they look a lot like the Superior Spider-Man tech web uh, shooters when it was mm. Doc Ock being Spider-Man. So uh, that's really interesting. But yeah, they look very Starky to me. Yeah. Uh, William Shatner <laughs> has said... Uh, he is totally game for being on Star Trek Discovery if, quote, he was useful. Uh, no word yet on if they're going to find a way to work the much older uh, Captain Kirk into a story that takes place before, the reportedly, before mm. the original series. But he'll be there if you want him. Time travel. Lots of time travel. Sure. Uh, uh, in some Star Wars news, uh, we've got... Uh, ABC is reportedly developing a live action Star Wars show, which awesome. Yeah, give yeah. me give me weekly Star Wars. Please, someone do that. Uh, and then also uh, we got the trailer for the trailer of Rouge One. Yeah. The, the trailer for the trailer it's fifteen seconds long. It's, there's not much, but we get a nice pick. We get a nice glory pick of a ship. Yeah. Uh, I thought we'd toss it over to the PTN Mark One. Sure. Uh, to see uh, what, what are we looking at here, uh, computer? Hello, Zach. What you're looking at is the U Wing, used for troop transport and cover fire. Interesting. And, huh. Mark One, I understand that if you want to get more deep into Star Wars stuff, that there's a show on Monday called Jedi Alliance at 2 p.m. where we're going to get a full trailer breakdown. Is that correct? That is precisely correct. Yeah, the trailer comes out, uh, well, whenever you're seeing this, it's on uh, Thursday, August 11th. Awesome. Uh, it'll be online. Uh, last bit of news, uh, No Man's Sky came out this week. The video uh, game. People uh, ha are just stretching all across time. The, it, it is so infinite. It is o The only thing more infinite than the amount of planets that you can visit in this game is the lack of, de is the amount of depression for people like me who own Xboxes <laughs> because it's a PlayStation exclusive. Uh, yeah, that game looks cool. looks like you can mine pretty much any mineral you want. It's yeah. a great mining simulator. So PC users also can use it. Unfortunately, I am Xbox and Mac. Oof. So I'm just screwed. Uh, but I want to play it. Somebody send me a P PS4. Oh, are we, get, are we asking for presents? Uh, well, I'm like, asking the space gods for presents. I want a pony. <laughs> All right, and that'll do it for this week's Ludicrous Speed. Uh, let's slow it down so we can actually discuss some stuff. First, I want to I wanna talk about Luke Cage. Can we talk about Luke Cage? <sighs> the the science-enhanced badass from Harlem. Yeah. Uh, this trailer was... So, I think this one headline I saw so, put it so perfectly. There's so much Luke Cage in this Luke Cage trailer. Yeah, it's my first reaction, and I posted as soon as I saw it, I shared it on Facebook, and I was just like, hot damn. <laughs> like, hot damn, that's a good trailer. Uh, the soundtrack is perfect. It's The thing I like about all of these Marvel shows we've gotten on Netflix so far is that all two of them, but three now with Luke Cage, uh, is that they all seem like they belong in the same world, but they also have very unique voices. Where like Jessica Jones felt very different from the voice of Daredevil. Yeah. And Luke Cage is looking to feel really different from the voice of both of them. I mean, everything from the score, which is being provided so by cool. a member of a tribe called Quest 
to uh, and like you can see like the, the music choices in these in the trailers they've put yeah. out so far so clearly understand the the tone of the concept and the character um there's i love the little nods like we have this picture <laughs> oh my they God. put up where this is this and i for, i want to show this for multiple reasons this is the, the science experiment yeah uh the, this, this is like the i guess the stuff that they had him hooked up to in order because they're basically they're uh for anyone unfamiliar they're experimenting on luke in prison when mm. he goes he wrongfully goes to prison uh, assuming they follow the original the close to the original story yeah um and they do experiments on him which is what gives him his impenetrable skin uh and they put him in his, the and comic book style yeah. yeah and the comic book style like cuffs his original and the freaking tiara tiara is beautiful they, his like they they found a way to put him in a tiara if you if you're unfamiliar with luke cage's original look go google it right now because it yeah. is one of the silliest it is he's in a bright yellow shirt and he has these metal cl cuffs and a tiara and a belt that is a chain <laughs> and it is extremely silly what i'm really excited about is that they are getting into like what happened to him originally yeah um because like um minor spoilers right here for jessica jones Mm -hmm. um, but because it, there seemed to be uh, implied some link between the experiment that created her powers and his powers, yeah, I'm very excited that we're going. We are going to go back. We are going to see the flashbacks. Um, as much as we could have just plowed ahead and not yeah. really addressed it, um, they are going to show us like what they what these scientists did to him and what caused it, and then that will have bigger implications towards Jessica Jones when they get into Defenders in season two. And who's behind all of these science experiments yeah, exactly. and stuff like that. Uh, um, let's, uh, let's talk about Arrival, oh, which is man. a movie that like I, wasn't even on my radar. It wasn't either. I was watching the Olympics, and I uh, saw it. <laughs> uh, but they, they put out the first sort of... Uh, the, the, they put out the first image or like mini trailer for it. Yeah. Uh, again, with these damn mini trailers. Just, Just give us a trailer. We don't need trailers for trailers. <laughs> but what oh, about a Hollywood preview? Listen, Doctor Hollywood, we don't need a tr preview for a preview, okay? Just give us the preview. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're unfamiliar uh, with the project, as I was, uh, yeah. it stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. So already a good cast. Mm -hmm. um, and the synopsis is uh, it reads when mysterious when a mysterious spacecraft touches down across the globe, or several space like there's multiple ones. Yeah. Um, an elite team led by an expert linguist, which is Amy Adams, uh, are brought together to investigate it. Um, then there's the, it's going to be dealing with issues of like potential of a global war. Yeah. Uh, th this to me seems like sort of uh, what like what if Independence Day had taken a different direction after the aliens showed up? Yeah, or like uh, or signs. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the idea that like aliens are showing up and it doesn't have to be. Oh, evil yeah this, or maybe it is but like that just that alone is an interesting question to take My, like the just between the synopsis and what i saw in the trailer it reminds me a lot of childhood's end yeah um or the first half of childhood's end um which they adapted on sci-fi to mixed results yeah uh but the, i love that we and you, you can see in the back that's of that image that we showed the, the spaceship which is very simple it looks like a, the Mana Chiwan from the Fifth Element, their spaceship, <laughs> which is all kind of has that kind of hive look. Yeah, but it's going to be a lot about communication. This, this seem to me seems like next level sci-fi. Yeah, um, like there's I, I love summer blockbuster sci-fi. This just looks like a straight up sci-fi. Yeah, movie. this looks like something that you would see out of Clark or Hanlon. Yeah, or one of like the big guys. So I'm very excited to see. Uh, what comes of it yeah when it when it came on like i said i was watching the olympics and when it came on i was like in the middle of a sentence and i just stopped talking and like all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up i was really like this the the teaser here look is very interesting and evocative i'm very excited about yeah it, it comes out on november 11th this year that's my uh, birthday and so. that that gives me a lot of it because that's right into awards time so yeah. that clear whoever like the studio that's putting it out uh they clearly think that this is going to be this has potential that also happens to be veterans day and armistice day hmm. which uh which might have some interesting implications all right well we'll see yeah we'll see uh but speaking of uh aliens oh goodness. Uh, we got to move into sci-fi in real life yeah uh because 
this this alien megastructure story guys, is getting weirder. Guys, this alien megastructure story is ruining my life. <laughs> um, so if you have, if you're not familiar with this, uh, it, uh, it, uh, one, this one star that they found while they were uh, scrolling through all the te- like telescope footage and everything and they, yeah. they examine the, how the light patterns move and that's how they study like planets revolving and like what kind of stuff is there mm-hmm. um this one star has been dimming in an irregular pattern and it's been dimming more and more at like an average of like three percent over four years yeah um is what i got out of uh engadget a lot of people are reporting on this uh but uh that's where i pulled the information from um, and a group of scientists who are studying it more closely have now determined, because they thought that it was comet clusters that were just like, oh, well, because those are, those change density. Yeah. Um, it could be blocking out the light. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they, they studied it more closely, and they've determined that it is most likely not comet clusters. So they don't know what it is. The quote is, no known or proposed stellar phenomena can fully explain all aspects of the observed light curve. The theory put forth is it is a manufactured megastructure in space blocking out a star. Guys, what? Let that sink in, guys. There's there's someone blocking a star. <laughs> the, like the the implications of that basically is saying like aliens built a huge thing yeah somewhere super 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 far away yeah can we send them a facebook friend request (laughs) can we poke them can we poke them on facebook Um, and be like hey why are you blocking that star what the the implication obviously the implication of this if if it was to be determined that it was proof that aliens were real is massive but yeah my brain just instantly started going to okay so what happens if we do figure that out. It's so far away, even a signal yeah. would take the speed of light would take thousands of years yeah. to even get there. Yeah. So what uh, here's the, my question to to you Jesse and then uh you guys uh, leave us a comment below cuz this is something thing I'm really curious about. What do you think we would do? It, let's say we we determine 100% that is an alien megastructure in space. Yeah. There are intelligent beings out there well beyond our reach. What do we do? Uh, I think we would maybe I I remember reading a thing about like a Morse code laser like highway thing that they, <laughs> they that scientists were talking about like if they needed to communicate long distance through space like they would have to send light and it would have to be you know you would have to be able to communicate through light even though, because light's the fastest we know. But even at these distances, light takes years and years and years to travel. Yeah. So I get the, well, the question for me, like, if, okay, Morse code, but obviously they don't have, they don't know Morse code on this alien civilization. So much the way that arrival is going to be, because they focus on a linguist and like, how, what, how do you know if what you're saying is offensive or not? Well, what would be, what, like, how, what would we do? Well, like the thing about Morse code is it is a simple pattern. And so you can assume that if these aliens are as advanced as building a space station in front of that, they know math. And like that's like when they sent when they send out things with like the hope of maybe discovering life, they always send out like Pythagorean theorem, uh, like simple math things to show like the communication, because regardless of language, math, as far as we know, is the same throughout the universe. So it's basically they'd be sending a signal and says, "Hey, we, hey, we're smart. Yeah, just we're bas- smart guys, come say hey." Just basically, like we have knowledge that is similar to your knowledge. And they show up with a pulse cannon and they punch us because we're nerds. Yeah, we're well, sending yeah, math yeah, they're space, space jocks, <laughs> <laughs> bunch of space jocks. <laughs> uh, Beating us up, putting us in a space uh. locker. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that's I think that's what the move would be, right? Yeah, like makes sense. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, you know what doesn't make sense? Oh, I know a lot that doesn't make sense. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> Buckaroo Banzai does not make any sense. Uh, but let's get, let's get into Buckaroo Banzai. Please do, uh, Jesse. Why don't, this you've you've seen this movie. A lot more than I like. Oh. 
I'll be I'm gonna be straightforward with you guys. Yeah. I had not seen Buckaroo Bonsai before. Yeah. That we decided to do this show. You're welcome. I went and saw it for the first time. You're welcome. What the hell was that? Like in a good way. Yeah. But what the hell was that? <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, if you are not familiar with the movie Buckaroo Bonsai, the reason why we're talking about it is because Kevin Smith is developing a show for for Amazon. Yeah, it's for- going to be on Amazon. Uh, re- apparently, they're going to do the the standard Amazon thing. They do with most, if not all, of their the shows where season. they pilot it, yeah. and then viewers vote. I can't imagine a world where Kevin Smith's like audience doesn't just flood that ballot box yeah, and get sure. his show. Uh, if you're not familiar with this movie, uh, the way I describe it to friends is Buckaroo Banzai is the most 80s movie that's ever existed. Between the music, the fashion, the acting, the casting, it is super 80s and it is like the most schlocky, corny movie <laughs> I've ever seen. It is about the character of Buckaroo Banzai who is a brain, uh, a brain surgeon, a nuclear physicist, a theoretical physicist, a samurai, uh, a gun and martial arts expert. He also happens to be the lead of the most popular band in the world. Uh, he has a group of Buckaroo Banzai cadets, which are basically children that he has trained as snipers. Uh, and adults. And adults, yeah. Uh, the dad was the, dad was the uh, helicopter. The, he had his, his buckaroo <laughs> bandits yeah. hat, too. Yeah. Uh, he has his own comic book. Uh, he has a direct line to the president at any time in his life. It is like... Th- the way I imagine this movie was made is they pitched it and they were like, this is going to be a five-movie franchise and you're going to sell so many toys because kids are going to love it. He's everything kids like. He's a theoretical physicist and a samurai. There are so many toys. It's it's so, it, the <laughs> levels of insane where you get the sense that, uh, to me, it feels like they looked at like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah. and were like, that worked because they just strung a bunch of words together yeah. and then made it a thing. It's, and this that's like physicist, samurai, rock god. Rock god. Like, uh, the basic, I'm going to just give you the bones of the plot as I know them. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai is in his theoretical uh, scientific rocket car. Uh They have attached to the car a device that will allow him to go into the eighth dimension um, where they plan on like getting samples and like experimenting, doing science stuff. Uh, He's late to it because he is currently performing brain surgery. Uh, He he gets there. He goes through a mountain and uh, he comes back and they bring back a thing that proves that he was in another dimension. Um, it also happens to wake up the creatures from the other dimension and let them know that there is a way back. Uh, there are creatures in our dimension that are uh, refugees that escaped from that dimension that want to get back, and that's John Lithgow, Doctor Big Boutte, uh, Doctor John Big Boutte. Doctor John. Oh, Big I Boutte. almost forgot. I was totally going to introduce Warfan. us as a. Uh... Oh, is the Boutes? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, John Warfan. He's John Lithgow is Dr. Lazardo, who is a guy who's been infected by one of these aliens. He's a crazy guy. He escapes. Uh, yeah, so the, the, here's the word. Like, the, it starts to go a little It, it just goes insane. Like, here's the thing. We could spend a whole, the whole less time trying to outline yeah. the plot. If you guys have seen the movie, you know the plot. Uh, but do we you? want to talk about, like, but it's almost irre- irrelevant. Like, we want to talk about what we would do well, can, if we were... Is there more that you really wanted to... Well, I just want to... Since this was your first time watching it... All right. Can you give me a highlight of your favorite part of the movie? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the part that I, like, weirdly wrote down yeah. is when I almost did a spit take. <laughs> yeah. When they shocked Buckaroo's... Or I think it was when they... Uh, no, they shocked... Uh, 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 Lizardo's groin. Oh yeah. For sure. some reason, it made me do a spit take. That was uh, really funny. A real life spit take, not yeah. a joke one. Uh, but like, I... can I get my highlight? <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah. For my highlight of the entire movie, uh, they're talking about super science. Uh, 
they're talking about like you know if you take that mountain and you destroy it and you pound it into dust you'll never see this thing that he brought back from the other dimension and then it's a hard cut to buckaroo bonsai and his band at a uh, at a club yep and they're playing music and buckaroo bonsai goes from guitar solo to tiny trumpet solo <laughs> in a matter of seconds he, he goes he like rips a really awesome guitar solo he puts the guitar down picks up a tiny trumpet and does a tiny trumpet solo it's amazing it's, it's so it's good ridiculous is what it is um uh so the the thing that, like the the thing that's that impresses me about it yeah is like underneath all the insanity yeah there's like actually an, a good sci-fi plot going on here for sure that's what i think it impresses me is that i almost feel like there's a version of this script that was like just a sci-fi story yeah that like didn't have this crazy lead character in front of it yeah but the, it turned into this at some point <laughs> they, or they like sh they like came up with all these ways to make it crazier yeah um to hit like a different market but i the idea like the idea of the eighth dimension just being like an alternate plane like you've seen that in a lot, like we saw that in stranger things yeah for sure uh the like all the all all these things that work like it was it was cool yeah it was it, interesting it had a lot of really solid sci-fi aspects around all of the craziness all of the good aliens are jamaican yeah that <laughs> which is really weird it's not it's it, it's never it's never explained. It's never hit upon. This is the thing. Well, this is why I think the remake is such a good idea. It, because there's so... Like, I, I don't think Kevin Smith is going to basically like make the same tone necessarily. It'll be... It'll not be... It's not going to be a serious drama or anything. Yeah. But I don't think for a series, especially today, that you can make it in this silly tone. Like this cartoony. Yeah, this cartoony. Yeah. But you can take all those pieces that are there... Um, and let's let's get into what we would do with okay. with a reboot because like, yeah. uh, just, trans just transitioning into it like um, the like what makes this such a such a fun thing to remake yeah what makes this uh, I think as you put it when you're bringing down a good bad movie yeah is that there are there is a story there and it's just silly around a like a good story yeah uh, so like. It, like I think that how I think you would explain like the Jamaicans mm -hmm. to make an accents way, and I don't know if this uh, forgive me if this somehow comes off if this comes off as offensive in any way. Yeah, all Jamaicans are from the eighth dimension. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> like that's his reasoning is that like oh it's all, that's all Jamaican people, like, people everyone from, from Jamaica are. Uh, I, I was going to say that the way you explain it is like you do a Beast Wars scenario where when the Jamaicans first arrived, on, or when the, the good aliens, the black, uh, whatever they're called, yeah. uh, arrive, there's the black ones and the red ones, arrived on Earth from the eighth dimension, where they arrived was Jamaica. The Lectroids. The Lectroids, yeah. They they arrived from and like the first transmissions they picked up were, you know, Bob Marley. And so how they learned to speak English was with a Jamaican accent. And, and then like they took all, on their forms. And they took on their forms because that's that's what they understood Earth language and everything to be like. That works too. Yeah. Or all Jamaicans are are, are from, red electro or are black, black electroids. electroids. The only the only thing I would say that is, uh, I I had a friend in college who was Lily White, but his family had been in Jamaica for like three generations, and so like he he had a really strong Jamaican accent, and people would make fun of him all the time. They'd be like, "You're not Jamaican." And he'd be like, "Actually, yes, I am. I was born in Jamaica. I grew up there. I'm now in Oregon, but I am Jamaican." I imagine that would be an that'd be a tough uh tough that, thing to explain. That's a tough world to live in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh but 
Yeah, so so you you kind of already start on it. Like, what's your reboot plot? What do you got going I on? I mean, I think season one, and this is what, uh, to be honest, like this is just what Kevin Smith is proposing. Yeah, it makes the most sense. But season one, you got you do you're doing this basic story. Yeah, um, where you have Buckaroo like break the break the eighth dimension, mm-hmm. um, and it becomes this like war of. Uh, I think there you got to raise stakes here a little bit. Yeah, where like them getting like them getting away like other not like drop the u.s versus russia thing yeah but them breaking the plane is going to like really break the plane and yeah. like smash these two dimensions together uh so maybe it's the eighth dimension taking over our dimension yeah uh if you want to modernize it with modern sci-fi you would put like i might put in a, an environmental tone where like the eighth dimension is wrecked and so now they want and like our full dimension. of radiation or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so it would just be, just the basically the the bones plot of this. Yeah. Okay. Because that's the plot that you bury under yeah. a guy who's like going to concerts like to rock out before he goes into brain surgery. So, so my plot is John Warfan wins. Oh. He, uh, because the thing, the aliens can make themselves look like humans. So are you saying that would be... John Warfan is the president of the United States. Um, as far as we know... This it, is where we start. This is where we start. As far as we know it, most of the government are red electroids, and uh, pretty much all of like the major powers in the world are controlled by red electroids. Uh, John Warfan finds out that in order to get back home, because he wants to go back to the eighth dimension, in order to get back home, it requires a massive amount of bioelectric energy that needs to be extinguished all at one point. And and in order to do it, he has to basically kill everyone on Earth at the exact same point. Uh, So that's why they have infiltrated all of the governments. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai, and I think this helps explain everything with Buckaroo Banzai, on the surface is just a band leader with a band, and they're touring the country. It just so happens that every city that they're in, a high-level red electroid gets killed, or like a, a red electroid operation gets destroyed, and they get to they just tour the country, because it's just a band on tour. They're going and doing tour. But underneath it, it's Buckaroo Banzai and the Buccaneers, uh, and they're like a special operations unit. You got Perfect Tommy, you got Reno, rest in peace, Reno, Nevada. You got you got uh, Pinky, you got the entire crew. Um, Penny Pretty is like uh, their uh, manager. And oh, interesting. So you would change her how she hooks, like at least meets up with the. Uh, I would, I would keep because I love that it's so weird. I would keep that she looks identical to Buckaroo's dead wife. Oh uh, yeah, you can't lose that. It's such the, <laughs> it's so weird. Like, uh, but she's identical, and so then you have like, because I think you can actually make that relationship really interesting, uh, in this reboot where Penny at least starts off not interested in Buckaroo at all, is not in love with him at all, isn't enamored with him is very much a business she's their she's their manager but uh but her actual job is to be like the go-between between buckaroo and the underground resistance see i want her to be i i, I could see that i could definitely yeah. the, the one thing that i think you need to do in this is beef up uh penny's role yeah that's what i'm saying uh, is like give her agency i would like i sort of want her because i like what you're what you're doing here with the band traveling around because that's a yeah. great way to make it a little not necessarily episodic entirely but to but, make it a little bit more uh so you can break it up into pieces episodes. yeah yeah um it's a great way to do it i would want her to be like just as smart as anyone in there oh, with, like, she is. like she but like if their if their if their job is like assassinating people, I want her to also be an assassin. Oh no! Like that's what I'm saying is like she's she's she represents the old government, like the old United States government. Like she is like a super spy from the CIA. It's and like she, un- and they're all working underground. Underground. And they're and so like the the original United States government is all underground, and 
Buckaroo Banzai is just this free agent that they have hired that they have hired basically to help them build this resistance. You're and, a loose cannon, Buck. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> but she you get results. And she's she's like the go between, but she's a super spy. But her Buckaroo Banzai Buccaneers role is she's the manager of the band. Uh, and yeah, so and I think there's a really interesting kind of dynamic if Buckaroo Banzai is immediately in love with her because she looks like his old wife and his dead wife and like immediately has this kind of enamored relationship with her. I think that's a really interesting power dynamic where she is not obsessed with him. She's, yeah. she's not in love with him and he has her on this weird pedestal. Yeah. I could totally see. Yeah. Uh, I could totally see that. I, I, I love that. Cause it beefs like it beefs up her character. Yeah. Um, and then you get, and then, like, John, you get to see, like, John Warfan in charge of the world, like, just being crazy, <laughs> like, and John Big Boutte being his, like, vice president who hates him so much, but has no, <laughs> has no choice but to follow his rule. Like, I wonder if it would be, more, it would be interesting for that, like, I love that as, like, the, as, like, what they're doing. I wonder if we start a little bit before and don't drop, like, right into it, but have like, them... Uh, like you just meet Buckaroo Banzai as this like weird amalgamation of things, yeah. and then uh, Penny shows up and drops him into this world. That's cool. Yeah, I like uh, that. Where <laughs> she just shows up, she she like gets there to show, and she like does the crying bit yeah. from the movie, but, but it's, it's a bit. It's a bit. Yeah, I like uh, that. And that like once they like bring her on team, she's like. Look, I represent the real president of the United States. <laughs> yeah. Oh, also, by the way, in the movie, while they're doing this loud dance rock and roll thing, Buckaroo Banzai stops it because he hears one person not having a good time. <laughs> uh, and then she tries to shoot herself. And when a gun goes off, everyone in the band takes out 30 guns per person. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I was when I was watching it uh, at home. Uh, somebody came in the room. This in the other room. Literally, just, why is everybody holding guns? <laughs> because I think the band, whoever was playing, uh, or whoever was playing drums, I think he pulled one out of a drum. Uh, yeah, he definitely pulled a like a shotgun out of a drum. Oh uh, God! All right. So we've got over our plots. Yeah, let's let's get into the the fun bit. Let's let's talk casting here. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't get everybody, so we picked like top six. Yeah. Uh, because there's so many good there's so many good actors and there's so many good characters that I hope come back. Even the like the the guy who works at the hospital that the Zardo oh, is the at janitor is, is so good is Jonathan Banks. Yeah. Who is Mike on uh, Breaking Bad? Yeah. And Better Call Saul. <laughs> I stopped when I saw that. I was just like. God, he is here. Yes, yeah. uh, it, it's insane. All right, so let's let's start off with our our lead man for me, Buckaroo. For me, Buckaroo Banzai, originally played by Peter Weller. Yeah, uh, RoboCop. <laughs> for me, Buckaroo Banzai has to be cool, and he has to be American because, like, the more serious he takes the ridiculousness, the funnier and the the better it is for me. Yeah. And so, like, I needed someone to be cool and American because Buckaroo Banzai feels very American to me. Uh, so I and also has to be kind of believable as a scientist. Uh, and so for me, I chose uh, Bradley Cooper. All right. Who uh, I think has shown that he can handle ridiculousness and treat it as serious as possible we've seen him in uh, a lot of movies i think he was under underappreciated in the uh in, in a lot of movies he's been in and i think he just would do a good job at it he's good i like i'm not sure i'm not sure how he fits into this like level of insane like he plays rocket but he don't we don't see him i don't know he's so but, but he's also in the hangover movies that's true. Well, Which are yeah. absolutely insane, and he mostly straight mans those entire That's movies. That's true. I guess it's. I guess I haven't seen him in that role other, outside of Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a role like that in a while. He's been doing a lot of these like more dramatic, sure. even where they have like a little like hints of comedy to them, like Silver Linings Playbook. Yeah, he's been hitting these really heavy. I, dra dramatic I want Buckaroo Banzai to be the most dramatic character ever. Oh yeah, he I has think, to be, but I he also it, needs to. But this is this is clearly gonna be like 
what I what I would call an hour long comedy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's Kevin Smith. Yeah. Uh, so my thought, and I, I, I think we hit a lot of the same points here. That yeah. like all American boy. Yeah. Who like you're like you are like the center that people form around. And yeah. so I, I but you you also want somebody who's going to connect uh, on a comedy length. So yeah. I went with John Krasinski. I absolutely hate this pick. I think it's the worst idea ever. <laughs> I think Buckaroo Banzai has to be cool. There's nothing cool. I mean, this is a great pick of John Krasinski. But I mean, that's the thing. Is like, I'm he's talk, I'm he's a about, nerd. I'm thinking about John Krasinski now, he's, after he's played like a war vet. No, he's an, he was an awkward nerd when he was a war vet, and he's an awkward nerd now. <laughs> I th- I disagree with John Krasinski. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I don't have a picture for it, but I, my backup choice, yeah. I'm curious what you think of this, uh, was Justin Thoreau. I'm, Who's not technically American, but he plays American. Yeah, I'm more well. okay with Justin Thoreau. My backup choice was Clive Owen, like, <laughs> uh, which is not American, but like that's the kind kind of like he needs to be so so dramatic. Yeah, I. Well, everything else is. I crazy. was actually like just in the role. I was lean, I was gonna go with Justin Thoreau, but yeah. it was like putting him in the in the rest of the cast that yeah. I had. I was just like, there's no way. So um, he, you're right. He is a little si- like John Krasinski, a little sillier. Yeah. But uh, so my my pick for perfect Tommy, who is the second in command, basically for Buckaroo Banzai, he wears shirts that are more collar than shirt, um, is Daniel Radcliffe, and for me, perfect Tommy has to be arrogant, and he has to be kind of like a jerk. Yep. And Daniel Radcliffe plays a jerk real well and having him with bleach blonde hair and being like this arrogant jerk uh in a role that i think he would really excel at and also has to like take things really seriously i think daniel radcliffe would knock it out of the park daniel radcliffe you're i think i think he could be good uh i went uh for a lot of similar reasons yeah with channing tatum i think channing tatum's too silly he's too well so here's the thing though i think that perfect tommy the way that like I envisioned him being yeah. played was like sort of that like he's just like I can do like I'm I'm perfect yeah uh, and Channing Tatum plays that like sort of dumb guy who is perfect yeah and like he can still play intelligent yeah uh, like twenty the the twenty one Jump Street movies like sure. he still plays like he's like good at his job yeah he's still... but he plays this like. But he's dumb. Somehow he's it's very intelligent and somehow really dumb, dumb at the same yeah. time. And to me, that that's what I got when I was watching Perfect Tommy. I think I think it's still good. Uh, uh, let's go on to to New Jersey. New Jersey, who's which played is, by Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum plays a cowboy in chaps the entire movie, Why? who's also a surgeon and has six shooters. It makes no sense. Yep. But uh, for me, I chose Cal Penn, uh, who I think can play the silliness. I do, I do love this choice. And also play, like, he's believable as a doctor. We've seen him play a doctor multiple times. Even in his silliest movies, going to White Castle, uh, uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, he breaks out being, like, having knowledge of medical things. Like, that's part of his character is his dad's, like, chief chief of surgery and his dad wants him to yeah. be a doctor. Uh, I think he can be that intelligent guy, but at the same time also be like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I love this pick. I, I, I almost don't I don't know if I can top it, but I'm going to try. I, th- I like uh, your pick as well. Uh, I went with Kate McKinnon. I think it's a great pick. For this pit, for this yeah. one. Uh, I think that uh, one of the one of the issues that the movie has is it's... It's a, all boys. It's all, it's a, yeah, uh, with the exception of Penny Pretty, um, which like beef a parole and all that, but like I think that we could like gender bend a f- few of these. And New Jersey, I think, is the perfect one yeah. because he's the new arrival. So to bring in someone like Kate McKinnon, who can be that like crazy over the top thing uh, person that you got out of Jeff Goldblum, yeah. Uh, while still like she's shown at like towards like the end of Ghostbusters, like there it, she does have a, a range to her. For sure, she just hasn't had a chance to show it off. Yeah, and I think this is the place to have her do it. Also, she's super hot right now. Like everyone's yeah. got a crush on she Kate just, McKinnon. She just her comedic timing is on point, and this yeah. is the role that really needs that comedic timing. Yeah, uh, uh, let's talk Penny. So for Penny, pretty. Uh, I wanted someone who was strong. Uh, I wanted someone who could play both kind of if she's pretending to be like this manager who's kind of weak, but then also a CIA agent. I wanted that. Uh, so I chose Anna Paquin. Uh, All right. I think she 
I think she is really like, you know, if you ever watch True Blood, she can play both of those kind of strong but also weak at the same time kind of characters. Uh, I think she she has the range and she's shown that she can do uh, like a cable style TV show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she could be cool. I, yeah. I, it would be a different role, type of role, well, at least what we imagined. Yeah, we it would imagined be a very it to be a different role. role. Uh, I went with Elizabeth Henstridge. I can never hate from, Elizabeth from Agents Henstridge. of Shield, yeah. uh, who plays Simmons. Uh, I, I just think like she would be the perfect person to like get involved in a group of scientists, sure. especially if we we make Penny into a scientist or like somebody who knows as just as much as these as the, the rest of the boys' club. Yeah. Uh, I think she can definitely take charge. We've seen on Agents of Shield, like every time they give her more to do, she like knocks it out of the park. She knocks it out of the park in ways that we didn't think she was capable of. She hasn't doesn't have that like long career. Yeah, that uh, people are maybe looking for. But I think that's part of why I think this would be a great role for her to take over for sure and shine in. And it might be a little close if, if she's a scientist. It might be a little close to Simmons. But I think that it's such a crazy world. I Plenty think of people play the works. same type of character yeah. in many yeah. multiple media. Uh, she's also just gorgeous, yeah, and I want to see more of her on television and movies. Sure, because you are a grocer. Um, it's, well, not, not a green she's grocer. Talented a gross guy. And <laughs> <laughs> she's talented, and she's beautiful. It's a winning combination. It is a very winning combination. I also want to see more, more of her on screen. Uh, I, then we get Dr. Emil Lazardo slash John Warfan. On the other side of the... The President of the United States. Uh, in your version. Uh, yes, in my version. Uh, he's the leader of the bad guys. Um, I chose for this... Uh, oh, you guys switched the pictures. Uh, 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 oh, did I swap them? Yeah, uh, Emil Lazardo. Oh, I chose... Yeah, we went I chose one. Bill Hader as Dr. Emil Lazardo. Uh you know he's playing this kind of like over the top crazy guy uh and he has like a weird accent and uh and he eventually becomes like infected with an alien like consciousness uh and i think bill Hader has shown that he has that type of range i think he's got the comedic chops for it i think he's just I think it was a good pick for it. Yeah. Um, I went. I wanted somebody who could be as crazy as John Lithgow yeah. in this. And Bill Hader is a good choice. I went with Ken Jeong. Sure. Uh, By the way, these last two picks, I have zero. Like, if any of these get yeah. picked, I'm okay with it. Because, uh, like, I would just... He's, uh, he's got the medical background. Like, we, we, we trust him as a doctor. Same thing. Sure. Uh, but he also, like, can play that, like... He, like I would believe man. that he... Like, when he goes crazy, I believe he would murder anyone. Yeah. In a heartbeat. Uh, and then, jo lastly, d uh, John, John Big Boote. Who, the character... Big Booty. Is, the character is someone who has... Uh, who has... Uh, was the leader and then resurrected the new leader and now feels kind of insulted that no one listens to him anymore. And is the second in command who wants to be in command. Uh, and for that, I chose John Malkovich who I think would be great at being like, why can't I be the one giving the orders? And like <laughs> that kind of character. And also is dangerous seeming and scary Yeah. at the same time. Yeah, I mean, this role I think is another one that needs to be expanded a lot because yeah. like we didn't get much from Christopher Lloyd in this. Like he was just sort of there yeah. doing his thing. But I think this character, you'd almost find, meet him first as like the on the on the ground big bad. Yeah. Uh, and then, or he's on the on the ground, immediate bad guy. And then once you get to Lazardo later. Then you, yeah. Uh, I wonder if it's fun to play, sorry, this is going plot a little bit, uh, if it would be fun to play that like we don't know that Lazardo is the oh. is the has been switched in in, in our version yeah. and then like it's only once you get to the presidency that she's like oh my god it's, it's you it's been this guy the entire yeah. time that's really cool i uh, like that that could be interesting uh and uh, last i put paul giamatti in perfect for dr big booty love it dr john big booty uh i i think paul giamatti is like he's just like that squirrely guy who like he like we've seen him in like shoot him up yeah he has that like sort of unassuming guy who's really dangerous for some yeah. reason uh He'd also be great. With Clive Owen. He'd be great. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, there's a lot of fun to, there's a lot of places who do you guys want to cast we want to know put it in the YouTube comments below or send it to us on uh, Twitter at Sci-Fi Weekly or send it to us directly we want to know what you guys think uh, who you think should have been cast who, who you've, would you cast if you've never so seen the movie before and you watch it because of the show please let us know your experience what you thought about it I would love to know yeah rather <laughs> insane yeah um, Lastly, let's get quickly to the mission assignment before we get out of here. All right. Last week we asked, in honor of Jeff Goldblum being in this movie. Sure. Uh, and having this ridiculous role. The most ridiculous uh, role. What is your favorite Jeff Goldblum character? Yeah. Uh, we got some cool responses. Oh, uh, who do we get? For, uh, maybe we got mainly just uh, we uh, the one from... Uh, what am I... What am I... Am I where my notes at uh from chase uh quantum of chase uh -huh. he says the underrated gold jeff goldblum performance the prince of egypt for oh. the animated route interesting yeah jesse what are you thinking uh my favorite jeff gold i mean it's a slam dunk it's the one on the tip of everyone's tongue dr ian malcolm <laughs> yeah uh, i mean hard to argue with it's hard to argue with dr ian malcolm from jurassic park uh that being said, I think there are a lot of characters. Like, I really like him from uh, uh, where he plays the foil to Bill Murray in The Life Aquatic. Yeah. I think that character is really fun and really silly. I forget the character's name at the moment. But uh, for, for me, one of the most memorable roles is Independence Day. Sure. Uh, David. Yeah, David is... <laughs> Like, it's, I mean, look, Jeff Goldblum plays Jeff Goldblum, no matter where he goes. Yeah. Dr like, Dr. Eden Malcolm is, it's got, it's like so easy. You almost, I, I feel like I can't not pick it. Yeah. Because that is Jeff Goldblum to me in all my memory. And also like representative resurgence in his career yeah. as well. Yeah. But I am, yeah. I'm excited. Like, uh, yeah, it's cool. It's, uh, it's. <laughs> It's fun. Uh, I I like Jeff Goldblum. I think he's a great actor. Uh, but Dr. Ian Malcolm. <laughs> uh, what I'm expecting to be among my favorite Jeff Goldblum roles is when he plays the Grandmaster in Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting. So insane. Uh, he's, a, he's a great actor. I met him one time. I've, I've met him as nice well. Super nice guy. He does a jazz night in at, L.A. Yeah, at the piano uh, bar. Yeah. Uh, I've met him as well. I met... I met him, and uh, he's taller than I am, which I was not expecting. He's a tall man. I'm, oh yeah, that's gotta be weird for you. Yeah, I'm six. I'm six three, six four on a good day, and he's got a couple inches on me. Yeah. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for uh, for Sci-Fi Weekly. Next week's mission assignment. Uh, we're gonna keep it real simple because we uh, we're gonna actually give you guys an assignment, something to do. Yep. Uh, go on to Twitter. Go on to Facebook. Make sure that you are liking and following sci-fi weekly you iTunes. can find uh, yeah i write us a review on itunes please that's do. the big one uh because it helps people find the podcast because we do this as an audio podcast as well if you're only watching on youtube if you're listening to it you can watch us on youtube at, at the popcorn talk uh but you, it, it's we're at sci-fi weekly on twitter and facebook.com slash sci-fi weekly super easy uh, make sure you're, you're following us there. We want to get to 100, uh, 100 likes and follows. That would be fantastic. Uh, it would be great. It would be super helpful to help us get out the word, to really build this into something else. Yeah. Because uh, we, uh, we're working on some, some uh, slight tweaks and changes, and we want to like come back with a, with a vengeance when we do. Uh, so we'll be back Wednesday at 3 p.m., every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Popcorn Talk. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at that Zach Wilson, T H A T Z A C H W I L S O N. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Jess Klein One. That's J E S S K L E I N, the number one. All right, guys, this has been Sci Fi Weekly. So long, and thanks for all the fish. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.